And yes, we're recording this meeting. So you all should be aware that when you're asking your questions, um, those will be in the recording. This recording will be up on my YouTube video channel um, sometime within the next week uh, after this evening. And so uh, you can go back to it again and again um, and share it with as many people as you want. Uh, I'm a big fan of giving away knowledge to as many people as you need it, and I love to share it. Um, and it's also worth saying that everything that I've learned, I've learned from other people, from reading and from practice uh, on the ground, managing many different kinds and styles and sizes of composting over many years. And um, I've made a lot of mistakes that I hope I can share with you as well. Um, so we're going to talk about backyard composting. That's why we're here. But I always like to frame it a little bit in why are we composting? We're also going to talk a little bit about the universal recycling law. As we're going through the presentation, if questions come up, please feel free to put those in the chat at any point. Um, and we'll get to all, as many of those questions at, at the end as, as we can. Uh, so don't hold back. You can add your questions as they come up to you in the chat. And it is likely that the first questions that come in will be the ones we get to first. Um, and also we'll be grouping some of those questions together so that we don't get too redundant in our Q&A. So why are we composting? Um, well, um, Vermont has one active landfill in the state of Vermont and it's up by Coventry, which is way up by the Canadian border. Um, so all of the waste in Vermont, um, all of our, anything that would be considered trash or ends up in the trash, gets trucked up to Coventry or it gets shipped out of state, sent to a variety of different places, maybe incinerators, um, maybe methane digesters, including currently um, a lot of the waste that's being collected, organic waste in Vermont that's being collected um, at some of our larger facilities and supermarkets is being shipped off to a um, methane digester in Maine. Much of the rest of it is being processed through small scale composters and medium and large scale composters throughout the state. And we're hoping to increase the number of small scale composters, including very small scale in the backyard. And that's where all of you come in. Um, the reason we're taking organic waste out of the landfill is because when organic waste decomposes in a landfill, it is done under anaerobic conditions. And what that means is there's not a lot of air. So the organisms that actually break down the food and the other organics that in the landfill are the ones that are producing those really stinky gases like ammonia um, and also the non-stinky but very damaging gases like methane, which is actually um, a lot more powerful as a greenhouse gas than even carbon dioxide is. So we're looking to reduce the amount of methane that is being produced. We're looking to keep our resources locally and build our soil locally using um, food waste and organic waste as a part of the way to do that. And we're looking to reduce the amount of trucking and CO2 emissions involved with moving waste around. The uh, recycling law, universal recycling law also, as you know by this point, is covering all of the recyclables in addition to organics. And we'll get a little bit more into that. A little more context, and this is where um, where I really like to focus on the reason that I compost and the reason that I like to learn about the organisms that actually manage our compost for us is because we have a soil health decline globally. Um, and it's really, um, it's really pretty scary actually how, how much we have managed to decline the state of global soil health in a very short time in the last 150 years, especially in the last 8,000 years total, and in the last 50 years excessively. Um, the map that you're looking at on the bottom left of the screen right now is just giving you a color-coded chart of very degraded, degraded, and stable soil, and then places where we don't quite have the data. And some of those places are covered in ice or are naturally a desert. <laughs> 
Um, we have managed to create more man-made deserts um, than I would like to acknowledge, but it's, it's the truth and, um, and that's really difficult. But the good news is that we can rebuild soil and we can do it pretty quickly and it's happening all over the world. And composting is just one way that we can help manage global soil health and the soil health in our backyards, which is what we're really all about as backyard composters. This slide is to just give an indication of how long things stick around. So on the left side, um, this is not my graph. I got it off the internet. It's uh, off Wikipedia. Um, and it's just letting us know like, how long do things last if, if they're just left? Um, and I think that's a really interesting bit of context when we think about how to manage our waste. What, what is the legacy that we're leaving behind um, for future generations? And on many fronts right now, it doesn't look so good. Um, but recycling and managing our, our waste and, and um, honoring our resources is one way that we can try and leave behind a, a little bit better of a future for the next gen. On the right side, um, I just wanna make it clear that I am not in any way advocating for putting those items in a trash can. I just like the way that this, uh, another Wikipedia free off the internet picture um, describes, and this is specific to Vermont, um, the amount of waste and the percentage of those categories of waste that we generally generate. So about 38% of the waste in Vermont that's generated is paper, and that can be recycled or composted. Um, you can compost all sorts of paper, and we can get more into that later in the presentation when we talk about ingredients and types of ingredients. But generally, I don't know about you, but between junk mail and everything else, I generate way more paper than my compost pile can manage. Um, plus, many of the kinds of paper are not really good for your compost uh, and are better off sent to the recycling bin. And as you move on down that list, you'll just see the percentage of items that we generally produce as Vermonters and almost everything in there can either be recycled or composted, which leaves us with only about 15% of what actually ends up in the landfill should be there. So that would save us a lot of time in terms of landfill life. The best practices for reducing waste are always to, to recycle, reduce, reuse, uh, use it again and again. Um, I always love the the phrase that I attach to Vermonters, but I think it comes from people all over the world, this idea of use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. Um, and I, I think that that really comes to the crux of how do we, how do we change behavior one household at a time? Um, and this little list here is just giving you some ideas of the way that you can do that. Food waste is a real problem. Um, and it's especially challenging right now um, when we see a 60% increase in the number of people needing the food shelves in Vermont due to the response to COVID, uh, the coronavirus. And um, I know that people in my community are really struggling. Um, and so to think that we're, redu we're, we're wasting food, um, that's something we could change too. So how do we waste less food? Um, there's an anecdotal story that it, when you go to the grocery store and you buy three bags of groceries, um, you might as well take one of those grocery bags and just drop it in the parking lot or give it to a food shelf. Um, because the statistics say that we all, every one of us really, I mean, maybe not every one of us, but on average, we waste a third of the food that we buy. Um, the global average is 30 to 50% of the food that is produced is wasted. And that goes from um, farm through trucking and production to restaurants and, and grocery stores and, and home refrigerators. Um, but on the average, uh, most households waste a third of the food that we buy. So how can we change that? Um, there is a great resource that I put in the chat uh, that I just wanna make sure everybody has access to. And it's the most recent update on the um, universal Re recycling law in Vermont. Um, so you can't click on it on the screen, but in the chat, you will find a link where you can click on that. And it's a nicely done presentation, a comprehensive listing of what the universal recycling law has brought us so far and the continuation of the rollout program for that law. July 1st, uh, in just a couple of weeks, 
is when we're finally going to see organics being um, refused at the landfill. Um, that said, there is no enforcement. <laughs> and I've talked to many, um, many managers of town uh, recycling and collection areas that have no interest or time or capacity to slice open bags to see what's in there. Um, but just know that all of those drop-off facilities throughout the state right now have a food scraps bin of some kind where they're collecting food scraps, all kinds of food scraps, including meat and bones. I generally don't recommend that people try to compost meat and bones in the backyard. Um, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more later as we get into the ingredients part of the presentation. Um, but even if you're backyard composting, you can still take your meat and bones to the drop-off facility. Some may charge you for that service, some may not. That just depends on your town. In my town in Thetford, it is included with the cost of the recycling pass, which is $25 a year. Um, other ways of managing organic waste are feeding animals. Um, uh, goats and pigs and sheep and chickens. Um, everybody loves, everybody loves food, loves food, loves food waste. If you are feeding your animals that are not pets but are uh, destined for market outside of your home, there are definitely strong recommendations and in some cases regulations about what you can or cannot feed livestock. If you're managing them for your own, those rules are different. Throughout this presentation, we're going to talk mostly about backyard composting. Um, but I hope that and when we get into the Q&A, you'll ask me questions about worm bins um, and hugel culture. These are just different ways of managing waste. Um, and in case hugel culture is a very new term for many people, I'll just say, uh, if you look that up, you'll find lots of great information about ways to manage lost, lots of waste wood. Say if you have a, a blowdown and you have lots of downed wood in your forest, or if you've just done an apple orchard pruning, um, or any number of other reasons why you might have lots of wood laying around, you can actually do something called hugel culture, which is an amazing way of doing landscaping and water catchment and also building soil. Um, so I'd love to be asked questions about that, but it's a little outside the topic of direct composting. And lastly, there are an increasing number of pickup services all around the state, um, which are offering in some cases, residential pickup at your driveway. In some cases, they're picking up from the drop-off facilities. And in some cases, they're also picking up from restaurants and or facilities um, and schools. Uh, at least they will when they're, when they're open again. Okay. No matter where you bring your food scraps, whether it's to your drop-off facility or it's to your backyard bin, make sure you know what can and cannot go in there. We'll talk a lot more about the ingredients of your backyard bin, but know that when you bring them to your local drop-off facility, the yes and no list is gonna be determined by the person who is actually managing the compost. Um, many composters, uh, like to run their compost through chickens first. Um, there are some sort of exhausting conversations and regulation pending about whether or not that's acceptable, um, but that's about all the update I can give you right now because the legislature is still in session and has not decided what to do about the food scraps rule for feeding chickens. Um, but in short, there are two agencies involved and that always complicates things. So just make sure you know what should or should not be on there. And please, please, please remove your fruit stickers. No matter what, they're plastic. Um, if chickens are gonna eat them, they're gonna choke. If you're gonna compost them in your backyard, they're gonna be there when you turn out the compost. They're gonna be there when you put it in your garden or wherever else you're managing your compost. Most facilities, um, have a large quantity of um, carbon materials or other ingredients that they add to the food waste in order to manage it well. And I'm going to be giving you the same basic formula just to use in your backyard uh, of carbon and nitrogen materials. So there's a lot of reasons why we would want to learn to compost in our backyard. Uh, they're listed here, but I do want to say that you save money. You know, when most of your trash weight 
is wet food scraps. Um, it's also the thing that makes your trash really stinky. So when I started composting, I started going to the uh, landfill or uh, delivering my actual trash just a few times a month and it was a drastically reduced amount, which means that I'm paying less money for disposing of it. So in my town, in a couple of towns where I, I recycle around here, I pay for a pass for the year and it allows me to recycle for free and now to, to drop off my food scraps um, for free. I mean, for the, for the fee that I pay per year. Um, but then additionally, I have to pay either by the pound or by the bag, depending on where I go for my trash. And my trash is really light. So make them weigh it. It makes a big difference. Whether you're composting um, at home or in the community garden or schools, it can all be done. Um, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but I just want you to know that there are many different kinds of composting out there. We're gonna focus on backyard gardening throughout this presentation. Um, if you're trying to compost in a community garden, your recipe is gonna be a little bit different. And the reason for that is in a community garden, we take all the vegetables home and all that's left is dry, stalky stuff. So it changes the content of the pile. Um, and if you have any questions about that, please ask those in the Q&A. Likewise, schools, businesses, and communities that wanna compost on site and have a lot of volume of food scraps uh, can get really high heat in a hot composting bin that kills pathogens, and then we can manage meat and bones as well. And I do manage such a facility at the Thetford Elementary School where our sixth graders have been managing the compost for about seven years. Um, and it's a stellar program that is connected also to curriculum. The first thing you want to do when you're thinking about choosing a backyard a compost is to choose a bin and a site. And this is one place where was, Zoom makes it difficult because usually at this point in my presentation, I like to get a show of hands of who's already composting and who's got bins and who's got piles. And um, so maybe we can try and do something like, like that toward the end. I'm very curious about what's working for people and what's not. Um, so on the screen now, you see a variety of different bins. They're all good. They can all work. The one on the top right, that's very fancy is, is one that my husband built, not for me. Um, we have one that, that's very functioning, but it's not quite as beautiful as that. Um, and that is my favorite style of bin, is a wooden pallet bin that's about four foot by four foot in diameter, about four foot tall, and has two or three bins. That is the one that I find works best year after year after year. Um, many people have the small black backyard composting bins. They can work well too, but it's a little bit different because you're dealing with a smaller volume. Um, everyone should have been sent a list of handouts um, that I had sent in beforehand that I like to accompany these workshops with. If you're watching this presentation after the live presentation, you can find all of those handouts on my website uh, which is also listed in the chat and on the bottom of most of my slides, and that's growmorewastelesscom I'm happy to give away information, so please use that up. No matter what kind of bin you choose, please consider the wildlife. Please consider everybody else that lives in your neighborhood that's non-human. That means your neighbor's dogs, that means the raccoons and the birds and the crows and everybody else, and definitely the bears. We're gonna talk about bears a little bit in a minute. What you're looking at on this screen is a product called Hardware Cloth. It is a hard steel sheet that you can buy at any hardware store. It's called Hardware Cloth, even though it's not clearly not cloth. Um, and what I like to use is the one quarter or one half inch diameter squares. If you get any bigger than that, mice can go through it. If you get any smaller, you get towards screen and then you'll be blocking airflow and you might, um, you might get some water issues because you won't have the, 
the right kind of ventilation through that when compost blocks up the stream. I like to line the inside of my wooden bins with this material. If I'm using a black plastic bin, which I do experiment with just so I can make sure that they work, um, I like to lay a piece of this fabric on the ground and then place my bin on top of it and stake it through it. And that makes it so that no one will dig underneath my bin and into it. Um, it works really great. And then when you're ready to empty that black plastic bin, you can just unstake it and lift the whole bin off uh, and, and, and go from there. And we'll talk more about the process throughout the year of composting. Bears are definitely an issue. And as we humans take more and more and more of their space, um, they need space to be. And when we leave out bird feeders and pet food on the porch or stinky trash in the backyard or a grill that's covered in grease or any number of other things in a compost bin, we have invited the chicken or the, the bears. I was gonna say chickens too, because when we have chickens, we're also inviting um, bears and other predators to come to our place. Um, so when we're creating the conditions for bears um, or other predator types to want to come to our property and um, sniff things around, then, then we are the ones that are responsible for that behavior. So the first thing that we can do is make sure that your chickens, your bees, and your compost are bear proof. One of the best ways to do that, according to the bear experts, is to use electric fencing, especially during the times of going into hibernation and coming out of hibernation for bears. So that would be late fall and early spring. This is when bears are out looking for food. They've just woken up or they're just going to sleep. Um, and th they want tasty treats. And we tend to leave them out everywhere. Um, another thing that I've heard that can work are motion sensor alarms uh, so that you can send your dogs out or send yourself out or something uh, when the alarm goes off. And I've also heard recommended ammonia soaked rags, which as a soil health um, advocate and organic gardener, um, I would not recommend that um, personally, but um, you might consider it if you have a, a serious bear problem. Um, I did just for the first time in 20 years have a bears crash through my compost. It was a mama bear and three yearlings. And boy, did they destroy the place. Um, I'm going to blame my husband um, because I've been living apart from him, taking care of my father. And so I haven't been home to manage the compost the way I like it managed. Um, and so it got a little bit stinky out there and the bears found it. Um, also, I can blame a neighbor down the road who was purposefully uh, feeding bears plates of ham, fat, and popcorn, um, which attracted the bears, of course. And uh, then they began to wreak havoc uh, on the humans in, in the neighborhood surrounding. Um, so it can happen. Bears will come to your site if you're not clean. And we'll talk about how to do that. So you, you've chosen a bin and now you wanna choose a site. One of the, one of the many hats I wear in the world um, is I, I do house calls. I'm a compost doctor. I, I show up with my three or four foot long thermometer and I take the temperature of your compost pile and leave you with a prescription for wellness. Um, and I can tell you that um, you really don't need to hire me to do that. Um, generally, when I get out of my truck, I know right away what the problem is. Um, and, and most people have a few common problems. One is that the site is too far away from their house. And so they don't manage it for half the year when we're in winter time. And that can cause all sorts of problems in your compost. Another is that people do not use enough carbon or dry brown materials. And I'm gonna go into that extensively in this presentation. A third one is that they don't protect it from wildlife, uh, which we've already discussed and I'll, I'll continue to re reiterate that throughout the presentation. And then uh, the fourth really has more to do with siting. In addition to maybe putting it too far from the house because they're worried about it stinking, 
Um, it might also end up going underneath a roof that sheds water and snow into it, which really creates not only a very stinky situation because it's too wet, but your, your January self is pretty upset when you gotta go bust the ice out from your compost to get in there. So don't put it under a roof. Um, you wanna be able to control the amount of moisture in your compost pile. I do put a lid on mine. Um, you'll see pretty soon when I get to those slides what that lid looks like. Um, sun or shade does not matter. Um, this is another relatively common, um, I won't call it a mistake, just um, I, I think in my situation, I would rather give my sunny place to growing food and flowers and fruit trees and nut, nut trees um, and save my shadier spots for things like composting. The heat from a compost pile comes from within. It does not come with, from without. It does really not matter much at all that your compost bin is black. It really does not matter much at all if your compost is in the sun. The one thing that will matter if your compost is in the sun is that you'll have to water it more because the water will evaporate out. But it does no uh, service to the microbes that are actually the biological workers making compost happen. Um, when you site your compost bin, if you're able, we do live in Vermont, um, try to not put it on a hill. And if you do put it on a hill, try to make sure that you're not creating a place for leachate to run out of your compost pile. One way to manage that is to make sure not too much water gets into your compost pile, so using a lid. And another way is to um, you know, make sure that there's enough sponge in your compost uh, as far as materials go, and we'll talk about that. Those are the carbon materials and brown materials. And the third way would be to just not put it on a big slope, especially right above a waterway, because the leachate from your compost pile is simply concentrated nutrients, which can be problematic if you are a fish or a bug. It's too concentrated for them. Um, if you are trying to manage large volumes of compost, you just want to make sure that you have a large enough area to do that. And if you are that person, please ask a question when we get to the Q&A. The ideal ingredient ratio for composting, sorry about that, is three to one. Now, these terms can get pretty confusing, so I'm going to try and be pretty clear here. Every book that I've ever read about composting is right. They just decide to describe it in different ways. There's also a lot of context involved in composting. If you're composting in wet Vermont or dry New Mexico, <laughs> you're gonna have some pretty different needs for how to manage that compost. Clearly, I'm gonna focus on Vermont because that's where we, we are. Um, but if you're watching this video afterwards, uh, please keep in mind that context of place really matters. So you have two primary ingredients in your compost pile. One is called browns. These are also called high carbon materials or just plain carbon materials or dead stuff or bulking agents. These are all the same thing, browns. It's all dead stuff. And we're gonna go into detail of all the different kinds of that stuff that's already all around you if you happen to have land where things grow. The other part of those ingredients, making up just one part for every three parts of the browns, is greens. These are also called our nitrogen materials, or our high nitrogen materials, or our food scraps, or organics waste. They're all green. So this is what we're collecting in our kitchens and our gardens, mostly, uh, is the greens. In addition to the browns and greens in a ratio of three to one, which is usually not what people do, I find when I visit compost piles, if there's a one to one ratio, um, that's you know pretty good, but more carbon is almost always the answer to a better compost. You also wanna make sure that you have the right amount of water, air, and of course that you give it enough time or turns to make it happen and we'll go through all of that a little more in detail. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one 
but there must be some math and science science geeks in the group. So I always like to throw in some numbers. Um, this is part of what I do when I'm helping a business or a school or a farm manage their compost. I'll come in and assess what their ingredients are and figure out the carbon to nitrogen ratio so that we can get a good balance of ingredients to get the right mix for the microbes to do all of the work. A little bit about microbes, because I, I, well, we'll talk a lot about them. Um, I, I, I'd love it if everyone came away loving microbes and understanding carbon. That would be two incredible takeaways from this presentation. Microbes are microscopic billions and billions and billions of organisms in the soil. They're also on our food, they're in our guts, they're in our compost bin. And if we're creating the right recipe for them, we're going to have lots of them proliferating in our compost bin. That's what creates the heat. They need a balanced diet. The three parts brown that they eat are the sugars or the carbohydrates that give them the energy to be able to digest the greens, which are the nitrogens, and they're also generally the proteins. So microbes need more energy to be able to digest proteins. This is another reason why we add so much carbon to the compost pile. Every single thing on the planet has a carbon to nitrogen ratio, including you and I. We're about 30 to one. Microbes are about five to one. Autumn leaves are about 40 to 80 to one. Why the difference of 40 to 80? It depends what kind of tree it came from. Sawdust and wood chips, 50 to 200 to one. So the higher the number on this chart, the more carbon it has in it. Everything has carbon and nitrogen and other things. Uh, so I hope that's pretty clear. When we want a hotter compost, all we have to do is add more air. And one of the ways that we add air is through carbon. So if we were in person right now, I would be passing around bagfuls of all of these ingredients so that you could get the physical touch to look and smell and see what these things are like and get to know them. Um, and so I'm gonna go around the sea, starting on the top right, those are bean pods. If you grow dry beans in your garden, save all those pods, they're fabulous brown materials for your compost. The second one is hay. You could also consider that dried grass clippings. So you mow your lawn, um, you can let those clippings dry out and they're a wonderful carbon material. You can also add them while they're green and then they would be treated like a food scrap or a nitrogen material. The third picture over are onion skins. Do you grow a lot of onion and garlic in your garden? When you clean those up for the year, save all those bits. Put them in your compost. They're wonderful addition of dry materials of those brown carbons. The next one is wood chips. Any size will do, ideally smaller than a half dollar or a quarter, and ideally mixed with lots of other ingredients. So bringing it back to the microbes again and how to invite them to your compost party and make sure that you have the perfect recipe, try and make it diverse. Different microbes actually like different foods. They like different sugars that are created by different plants. Um, the more diversity you could get into your compost pile, the healthier your compost will be. Underneath those wood chips are three different uh, pictures of different sizes of wood shavings um, and sawdust down next to that. So all wood products can be composted. It doesn't matter if it's from oak or black hickory or walnut or um, sumac or pine, you can compost all of it. Everything has a different rate of decomposition based on its chemical makeup. And we can talk more about that if you'd like to ask me questions um, in the chat. Shredded paper or any kind of paper, really, uh, the smaller the pieces, the better. When we lay in uh, a sheet of newspaper on top of our compost, we're basically blocking off water a little bit, and that's gonna create an anaerobic pocket underneath 
that paper. So again, anaerobic, we talked about this with the landfills, those are organisms, anaerobic microbes, that prefer to live in environments with little or no air. And one of the magical things about microbes is they can go dormant or become revived when the conditions are right. So you could have a beautiful aerated compost with aerobic organisms in it, billions and billions of them uh, eating everything up and pooping and reproducing and creating heat and decomposing those food scraps. And then you could add a layer of uh, big leaves or paper that might uh, change the way that water flows. And then you'd get a stinky pocket underneath that because the anaerobic organisms would turn on because you've created the perfect conditions for them. And the aerobic organisms would turn off because those conditions are no longer suitable. So I hope that's clear. Um, other kinds of paper that can work really well are um, paper towels of any kind, tissue paper. I tend to stay away from the ones that have like weird lotions and other things impregnated into them. Um, here you see brown paper towels. It doesn't matter if they're brown or white or whatever. Um, we noticed at school, the Thetford Elementary School, where we manage all of our food waste, um, about 180 pounds per week throughout the school year. Um, when we started composting, we had all sorts of um, creative <laughs> ways of getting um, carbon materials on site. And then we realized that we were throwing away or trying to recycle bags and bags and bags of brown paper towels. Uh, so we started adding them to our compost, reduced our waste at school immensely, um, and we make beautiful compost using um, brown paper towels, wood chips, um, horse manure, and wood shavings. That's our mix at, at, at the school. The bottom right is just showing you a little trick. Uh, those are leaves in that barrel. Um, so all leaves are great for compost, but I recommend if you can that you chop them up first. If you have one of those mulching mowers, that's perfect. You can also just lay them on the ground and run your lawnmower over them um, before you put them in a barrel for the winter time. So be thinking about also that even though we're in the age of climate change and our, our summers and winters are pretty unpredictable, theoretically, we still have six to eight months of winter here and we're still composting during those months when these materials are covered potentially under snow. So that means when it's warm out, we need to start stockpiling these ingredients so that we have them to get through our composting needs all winter long. This is in your handouts. This is a um, handout that is now being put out by the Sustainable Jobs Fund of Vermont um, and Farm to Plate, uh, but it was originally made by the Highfield Center for Composting, whose website is very good and is still up, by the way, um, being housed at the, um, the Sustainable Jobs Fund website. Um, I love this handout. This is what we use at school. This is what I give to schools when I'm um, doing consulting for composting with them. And it's also what I use for backyard gardeners and my compost doctor visits. So it doesn't matter what size container you're using. What you're looking at here are four potential recipes out of hundreds of potential recipes. On the very left side, we're listing materials. These are just a sampling of materials. There could be many, many more to choose from. What I want you to notice is that on the top row, we're looking at food scraps. And for every one container of food scraps, and again, that can be a five gallon bucket, it can be a yogurt container, it can be a 55 gallon drum. It doesn't matter what size, as long as you're using the same container to get the ratio for all of the other ingredients. So for every one bucket of food scraps, you have three buckets of brown materials that you're gonna mix with it. So this is a wonderful guide. And so the way this works is, let's say you don't have any mulch hay. Well, it looks here, if you're gonna follow one of these four recipes, you would not be able to follow recipe four, but recipe one, two, or three would work great for you. If you don't have any horse manure, and you generally don't need manure in a backyard bin, but if you can get some, definitely use it. It's great stuff. 
doesn't matter who it comes from, honestly. Um, manure is full of microbes and it's very high nitrogen and it's gonna heat your pile right up. Um, if you don't have horse manure, you could use recipe four here. We're using horse manure at the school as a brown item. So that might be a little confusing. I just wanna add some clarity there. Manure is generally considered a high nitrogen or a green item, even though it's brown in color, usually. We're using horse manure with bedding. So it doesn't say that here, but that is the product that we're using. The bedding material is generally wood chips or sawdust or hay, which are all high carbon materials. And of all the manures out there, horse manure is some of the highest in carbon compared to others because of course, horses eat grass, which is a carbon material. So that makes some sense. So I hope that this handout is helpful. And I just wanna reiterate that there are hundreds of possible recipes. And if you're concocting one in your mind now and you wanna check and see if it's good, ask that question in the chat. If you can get the menu right, these are the stars of the show that are gonna come into your compost pile. These are the ones that you can see. Um, these are larger than life pictures. When I work with kids, at the elementary school, we'll often take samples of finishing compost in magnifying glasses and see how many of these critters we can find. These are all your friends. Do not worry when you see them in your compost. They are working for you. And in fact, so are maggots. If you have maggots in your compost pile, um, don't worry. If you can get it hot, they'll all disappear. Generally, maggots are coming from flies. And generally speaking, flies like to lay eggs in anaerobic environments. So that means your compost was wet and stinky and it attracted the flies and now you have maggots. Or if you're trying to compost meat in the backyard and you don't have enough heat in the compost pile, you will get maggots. When your compost gets hot in the center, like 140 degrees, those maggots cannot live. Um, so we're gonna get into now the building of the structure. And this is really important. So it doesn't matter what kind of bin you have, this same recipe will get you to where you need to go. And you'll notice if you downloaded my handouts that there are two that are pretty identical. One of them has a picture of the thermometer on the front and the other has a picture of a black plastic bin. Those are my step-by-step -step instructions for how to compost in this fashion. And the only difference are the measurements that you're using because the black plastic bin is smaller. Otherwise, they're the exact same instructions. So what we're looking at here on the screen in the drawn image, the brown area is representing where the brown items would go, and the green area is representing where the green items or the food scraps would go. It's never gonna look this neat, nor do you have to ever worry about that. Um, I like to teach a donut style. So to give a little bit of clarity to that in my handouts, you'll see that I talk about a donut and a donut hole. If you look at the picture on the bottom right here, that is my compost and that is how I start it. First on the top right, you'll see a lot of uh, what look like sticks in the bottom of that bin. Those are actually uh, silphium stems. So that is a tall perennial with square hollow stems, silphium or cup plant it's called. Um, and I grow enough of it to be the bottom of my compost once a year. You can also use any perennial stems. Uh, you can use sunflower stems or corn stalks or all those big thick things that come out of your garden at the end of the year make a great bottom for your compost pile. And I recommend to go with the rhythm of our season in Vermont and to start a new compost in the fall when there are lots and lots of brown materials available that you can store for the winter. So that's what I'm gonna take you through. This layer of brown on the bottom and all the way around the food scraps acts as a biofilter. We'll talk a little bit about what a biofilter means later. On top of the six to 10 or 12 inches of crisscrossed hollow stems on the bottom of the pile, I form a nest 
of hay or a donut of hay. And the center of that, that depressed area, is the donut hole. And that's where my food scraps go. So we're going to start the pile with dry, hollow stems, ideally corn stalks, silphium, um, sunflower stalks, Jerusalem artichoke stalks. I would not use knotweed, just in case you're thinking about that, because that's also hollow. Um, but knotweed can be problematic. Um, so I would avoid using that in the compost pile. So you're gonna start with your dry hollow stems. You're gonna crisscross those layered on the bottom with at least 12 inches. Now that's including um, air and everything. You don't have to get them um, covering every bit of space. What we're doing there is we're building in an air structure on the bottom that will be able to hold mass above it and still bring in air on the bottom of the pile. Once your compost has the right recipe inside, it's going to heat up. Even if it doesn't get to 131, which is pathogen kill, that's the temperature you need to be at for three days solid to get a, a pathogen kill, and that's everywhere in your pile. It's also the temperature you need to kill weed seeds, again, everywhere in your pile. And most backyard composters are not going to reach those temperatures unless you're a total geek like me, which I welcome you to do because <laughs> it's really fun. Um, so that bottom air structure is allowing for the conditions of convection to happen. When the inside of the pile above that heats up, it starts to pull in air from outside the bin. And that air is critical for microbes. Microbes need to breathe just like you and I. So this biofilter on the bottom is bringing in air. It's also acting as a bit of a sponge to collect moisture throughout the pile. As we build the pile up, I continue with that donut shape, leaving my compost and enough carbon in the middle to create a very active hot compost pile. That donut shape goes up all the way around the sides and it's acting as a barrier. It's preventing moisture from leaving. It is preventing heat or um, it's not preventing, it's reducing heat loss in the pile that is created by the microbes. It is allowing for constant airflow to come in through the side. It is providing sugars for microbes. It is a bit of storage for my carbon materials that I can continually mix into my compost pile. And it makes it so that from the outside in, you see zero food scraps and you don't smell them. So if you're a bear or a raccoon and you don't see or smell food scraps, you're likely gonna walk on by. And that has been my experience up until very recently, as I mentioned earlier. So you make your food scrap deposit right into the middle of that donut hole. I like to add my greens and then my browns. Um, what you're looking at here is a different system. This one is at the Thetford Elementary School where we actually have an insulated bin. So we bring the food scraps all the way to the edge of the bin. Um, most of you don't have an insulated bin. Uh, so I'm going to recommend that you follow the steps in my handout and in this presentation by building up a donut and having a biofilter around and sticking to that circular pattern of dropping food scraps in the center of the donut hole. When you put your food scraps in, try for no more than four inches per layer and try for no less than 12 inches of carbon material. Ideally, you're mixing those, but you can just layer them and that's fine too. Um, you don't wanna put any less than four inches of the browns. Um, if you're using a crushed up leaves or sawdust, as opposed to big stalky stuff, um, then four inches is gonna be fine for those small particles. If you're using really big stuff, allow yourself to go a little more because you're bringing in a lot of air with that um, because of the shape of those materials. So shape matters and pile shape matters. Um, because we're in an insulated bin, we're doing a flattened system and this actually has a lid on top of it. On the right-hand side, you can see a bit of a cone shape. 
I recommend if you have just a pile and not a bin, which some people do, you can still try this biofilter method so that everything is covered with hay or leaves or some other brown material and keep it pitched so that water will run down it rather than collect inside of it. If you do the donut hole like I am recommending and you don't have a lid on your compost, you have now just created a place to catch a lot of water. So be mindful of that. Temperature and moisture matter. Um, at the elementary school where we do the composting, um, the kids monitor the temperature and the moisture um, at three days a week. Um, and so that's telling us the health of our compost pile. The reason we take temperature is because after we've reached a peak high temperature and it starts to drop, that is telling us that air is leaving the pile and microbes are going dormant. And then it's time to turn the pile to reinvigorate the oxygen in the pile and to mix the ingredients again. In my backyard system, I never turn because I build in so much carbon with that cross pattern on the bottom, I am building in an airflow infrastructure that requires no turning until the pile is done. And we'll get there a little later in the presentation. If you wanna take the temperature, you can use a meat thermometer to do that. Just make sure that you can go in 12 or more inches into the pile to the active place. You do not need to take the temperature. So if you're just starting out and this is overwhelming, just skip the temperature altogether. Um, it's just for us geeks so that we can know if we're getting pathogen kill and we can monitor the health of our microbes. Um, one of the handouts that I sent out as well was how to do a moisture squeeze test. Um, and you aim for about 50 to 60% of moisture in your pile, which is essentially like a wrung out damp sponge. Um, so the quick way to do this is uh, with a hand, or if you wanna wear a glove, you can do that, but I prefer to use my bare hand. Reach into what looks like finished compost. Don't do it with food scraps, cause that's gross. Um, reach into finished compost and get a handful and squeeze as hard as you can. You should see beads of moisture between your fingers. That's perfect. If it drips, it's too wet. So that's test one. And if you don't get any beads of moisture, it's a bit too dry. So that's test one, the, the drip test. Then you open your fingers and look at what's left. Did it stay in a clump? Did it fall apart? Is it like coffee grinds? Is it a big wet mass? And between those two tests, you're gonna be able to determine the basic moisture content of your pile and know whether or not you need to turn and add carbon or add more moisture or you can just walk away knowing that everybody's happy. So to turn or not to turn, um, as I said, I never turn, um, but why you might, um, if the pile gets really stinky, which means it's gone anaerobic, which means likely the air has left and maybe you've also gotten too much moisture in there, especially if you don't have a lid on your bin, the way to fix that is to turn it and uh, re-collaborate your ingredients. Every time you turn, you speed up the process of composting. So if you're in a rush to compost, you want stuff this season, go out there and turn it every day. Um, those barrel composters are designed to be able to be turned every day. And that's a very important part of using those barrel composters. Um, I will say that I've never seen a good finished compost come out of a barrel turner. Um, I, I think of barrel turners as step one in a composting process. So if you have a barrel turning compost system, please ask me questions about that so we can troubleshoot um, the problems that I'm sure you're having. Um, the one great thing I can say about the barrel turners is uh, I have not heard any reports of bears getting into them, but I have heard reports of bears running down the road rolling them. <laughs> um, every time you turn your compost, you're also cooling the pile because you've now just added a lot of air. Usually, if you have a thermometer and you're checking the temperature, you'll find that within six to 48 hours after turning your pile, the heat will go up. If it does go up, that's telling you that you still have activity in decomposition composting happening in your pile. If it stays ambient or does not go up at all, that's an indication that your compost is finished. 
Other ways to turn a pile or add air are to build in lots of carbon materials, as I've instructed. Um, you can also poke it a lot with a stick or a piece of rebar or a spade fork or a pitchfork. Um, and some people even really like to get super fancy and build in um, PVC aerated pipes and things like that. So the gadgety people, uh, there's plenty for you to do as well. Um, if you're in a hurry, turn it, turn it, turn it. At school, we turn our compost every 30 days. And the reason we do that is because at 180 pounds a week, um, it, it fills the bin pretty quickly. Um, sometimes it, we might even go 60 days. It just depends on the conditions and the volume in there uh, and what the thermometer tells us to do. Um, so because we're managing so much mass, we have to turn it. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have to. And um, I'm lucky that we generally, when school is in session, we have fourth and fifth graders that are happy to come out and turn the bins for us. So if you're lucky enough to have a bunch of fourth, fourth and fifth graders, turn that compost as much as you can and you'll get nice finished product pretty quickly. Uh, and likewise, if you happen to have a bucket loader, <laughs> you can also get compost pretty quickly. Um, just make sure that you build your bin big enough for the bucket. Um, we're coming to a close here on the presentation. This is a, a sample of how we do it at school. So for anybody who's interested in learning how to turn and get compost quickly or manage a lot of it, maybe you have chickens and manure or horses and manure that you also wanna manage, or maybe you run a landscaping business and you have a lot of leaves and things like that. Um, if you're looking to do these kinds of volumes, what I recommend is that you have a series of bins that you have one bin that is active, especially if you have other people managing the system with you, it's important to always have one place where the active food scraps go so that they don't get mixed into the finishing piles. So the active bin here is indicated by yellow when that is full or when the temperature lets us know that it's time to turn, we would to turn the entire contents into the second bin labeled bin turn one here. When we turn, it's important to fluff and not flop the material because you're adding air, not squishing it out. Then when the second bin, or when the active bin fills a second time, that blue bin would go to the green, the yellow to the blue. When the yellow bin fins a third time, the green goes to the red, the blue to the green, et cetera, et cetera, until finally we turn it out into a compost windrow which I'll show you in a moment. Capping the pile um, is another one of those mistakes that I see people make a lot. Um, so what I mean by that is just call your compost pile done and start another one. How many of us have a compost pile we've been adding to for six years? Um, try harvesting that, it can be challenging. Um, so what I recommend, as I said before, is that every November, I start a new bin. I have lots of brown materials. I have everything I need to make my donut hole and make my air um, crisscross pattern underneath with the corn stalks, et cetera. Um, and then at that time, whatever bin I'd been using all year, I cap it. And what I mean by cap it is I put a nice thick layer of carbon materials on top. I cover it with sheet metal. This is my beautiful lid here with all of the pieces of wood that are too hard to split. Um, and it suffices to keep the majority of water out of my compost. I cap that bin, I walk away, and next spring when I dig into that bin, I have this beautiful dark chocolate egg of compost inside, which is what you're looking at on the top left. On the top right, once I take that material out of the bin. On this particular occasion, I emptied three bins. So if you look carefully, you'll see three brown, beautiful piles of compost to the right and one of hay. That hay is what came out of my compost that did not decompose. Your biofilter won't decompose because it's all carbon. It's just gonna continue to dry out everything inside decomposes and along with all the hay I put on the inside. So that carbon biofilter can be reused. So I separate it out of the pile. I, I don't sift it, although you can sift if you wanna get like super quality stuff. I just pull out the big stuff and let the less, 
left, uh, let the rest finish in my composting windrow. Um, so, and on the bottom, we're looking at a pile on the left that I pulled out in December 2015. So this is a pile, I capped it, I walked away from it. In this particular case, it was I think a year later because we have so much compost, we don't have to rush to it. I turned that out of the bin because we needed space for a new bin. And the following May, you can see how chocolatey dark brown that looks just from having sit out. And the reason that one on the bottom left has kind of a reddish tinge is that year we used a lot of sawdust in our mix. So this is what a compost windrow looks like. Um, when I do this at home, the windrow is just a pile. I let it sit there. Sometimes I cover it, sometimes I don't. I probably should. I'm not above a stream. I may be losing some nutrients, but really the main use of compost in the garden is to add microbes and soil organic matter, um, and they're the ones that provide the nutrients, the microbes. It's, it's not about um, actually getting compost and phosphorus, et cetera, out of or nitrogen and phosphorus out of your compost. At school, um, we cover our windrows. Um, if we bring our compost out in the middle of winter, this windrow would be wrapped like a burrito so that we can contain all leachate inside of it. And then in the spring, it would be lifted and put directly on the ground, which I like to call the highway transportation system for all of the macroorganisms, the worms and beetles, and all the big guys that are gonna come in and finish the compost. Um, so I often get questions, what is finished compost? Finished compost is compost that after it is turned will not heat up. That means it's done and it's in its most humus-like state. You can use unfinished compost, but it's recommended that you do that on fruit trees and berry bushes and not places where you're growing crops that are gonna be ready too soon. Um, because of possible contamination problems. So that is the end of my presentation, and I would really love to shift to some Q&A. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn your video on if you'd like. I'd love to see your faces. And my co-hosts are going to help us get through the questions. There we go. There we go. So I have some questions that were that I have written down, so you can answer for them. Kat, um, the first question was: Will Springfield have a drop-off area? <clears throat> I thought that Springfield already did have a drop-off area at the recycling center. I think when you go to your transfer station, you just need to look for the um, the green bins. They're like they're probably thirty-five gallon. Um, trash totes on wheels, um, probably off to the side somewhere so they don't get knocked over by the crowds. Um, every, every site has their own setup. Um, so you should find those there. Um, if you do not, the thing to do would be to um, call your uh, local facility, ask for Mary Bryant, who is the education director um, in Springfield for the central Windsor solid waste management, some really long, I can never remember it. Um, and either she or Ham Gillett from the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District would be able to Excuse direct me, you, you have to the to, uh, Free everybody's video. Okay. How do I do that all at once? I see Bob Farnham is on the call. <laughs> <laughs> or we can just look at you. Well, I would like to, I would like to share everybody's video. Yeah. This is the host has stopped it. I'm the going host. by everybody's names and asking them to start their video. Okay. Well, uh, if there are any Zoom um, experts here, feel free to give us advice as to how to get yeah. everybody's video. Okay. Great. 
Okay, I'm gonna let, I, I'm, I'm getting distracted by the chat. I'm gonna stop looking and ask <laughs> you, to, yeah, you'll ask me the next question. Okay, so the next question was, um, if we use cedar shavings as cat litter, can we compost it? Um, yes, you can. Um, two things. One is I don't recommend putting pet feces in your compost that you're gonna be using in your garden to grow food with because there are transferable pathogens uh, that if you're not getting pathogen kill, uh, you risk transferring those into your veggie plot. Um, I do compost my cat waste and I use um, sawdust or those um, wheat pellets that you can buy at the feed store and they work really well. I compost separately um, and I use the finished product in my lawn to improve the places where I drive each year and it works great. Um, one other thing about um, managing a high carbon mass like that, there's just generally a lot more wood shavings than there is poop. Um, you want to add green material. So that's a great place to add your green grass lawn clippings um, or uh, clippings from your garden or dandelion tops or, um, you know, especially things without seeds if you're worried about spreading seeds around your yard. The other thing I'll say um, is that cedar in particular is a kind of wood that takes longer to decompose, which is why we love it for building materials. Um, it has in it um, uh, oils, which why is it, they're antibacterial, antifungal oils, um, which is also why we sometimes see cedar-based cleaning products, also pine-based or citrus-based products all the same reason they're antibacterial and antifungal. Once you leave those out for long enough, those oils volatilize and everything composts just fine. So just know that if you're using, um, if you've heard stories like you can't compost oak or you can't compost walnut or you can't compost pine or cedar, that's why. It's those volatile oils, they just need a little time to, to outgas and then they will decompose too um, if it weren't true, we'd all be swimming in pine needles up to the sky. Okay, so next question. Um, during the presentation, it said um, veggie scraps. Uh, what about fruit scraps? Apple core, oh. citrus peel? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for that clarification. All food scraps, all of them. There's, there's nothing you can't compost. Um, and I imagine we'll get some pretty specific questions, but I did just hear citrus peels. So that's related to the last answer. Um, you can totally compost citrus peels of any kind in any volume. However, if you are trying to only compost citrus peels and the only thing you're adding to it is like eggshells, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. You need a good recipe, you know? So you have to follow that three to one, think about diversity. Um, and if you're just not a big vegetable eater and you're not producing much in the way of green stuff, take your grass clippings, take weeds from the woods, add them all because those green materials are important for microbes. Okay, then we have, um, can cat litter with wood pellets be used to compost? If so, how much? Yeah, so same as that first answer, absolutely. And it, follow that three to one recipe as best you can. Um, and again, finding green materials around your yard and landscape that you can add to that cat litter compost, which should be different from your food scraps compost if you're planning to grow food with it. Hey, so someone had mentioned we live in a pine forest. How can we use dead branches and pine needles to create compost? Yeah, so you totally can. Um, keeping in mind, again, ab about the volatilization, volatilization of those oils, um, so it takes a little bit longer for pine to break down. If you can get any other ingredients in there to mix that up, the microbes will be much happier and they'll perform uh, more quickly, getting you higher heats in your compost. Um, branches you can do, I mean, if you can all run them through a wood chipper or something like that first, that's better. Um, Trees, branches, generally just, they take a lot longer to break down because there are lignans in the wood and all different kinds of trees have lignans, um, some to different degrees than other aiding in their ability to break down quickly or not. Um, so just know 
For instance, uh, I will sometimes recommend if no one, if, if you're gonna start a compost pile right now, the way I'm recommending, you're gonna be hard pressed to get hollow corn stalks and all that to do the bottom with. So you can use sticks. You can do that as a crisscross pattern for the bottom, but remind your future self that when you dig into that compost, your fork is gonna get all caught up in those sticks. So just remember that. So next question, are wood ashes good in compost? Um, so wood ashes are already done. They've been eaten by fire. There's nothing left for microbes but minerals and microbes don't really need minerals without plants to help provide um, those minerals too. So wood ashes are great in the garden. They're great in your field and they're great to add to finished compost before you spread it out on a field or in a garden. I would keep them out of the compost. Again, they serve no food purpose at all for microbes and it will cool your pile down and create a place where air and water will have a hard time moving through and you'll get anaerobic pockets in there. Um, when you, if you've ever added wood ash to your compost pile, you might notice that when you turn your compost out, there is an exact layer of the wood ash that you put in there because it doesn't change any further. Okay, someone had mentioned we have a black bin, believe it's too dry, it's full, what do we do? Um, what I would do is I would empty it and relayer it and water it um, without actually seeing the contents. Um, it's hard to say, but I have seen bins dry out to the point where all the food scraps are recognizable and just completely petrified. <laughs> because there was no moisture, so microbes never moved in. It just became this like preservation bin <laughs> for, for dried out food. Um, so compost needs moisture. So you wanna try and reestablish a layered system with browns and greens, either layered or mixed together with enough air and moisture. And then you're gonna see the heat go right up. And especially in this kind of weather conditions, um, it's going to shrink right back down and you'll lose a lot of mass quickly. So I would restack the bin um, when you're turning it out. If there are no recognizable food scraps, um, you could try just giving it some water and turning it and within a short amount of time it would be done. So it just depends on what the state of doneness is in that compost pile right now. And the last question I see on here is how far away from a stream does it have to be? Um, I believe regulations for things like that. I mean, there are no regulations for how far your compost needs to be from a screen for, or from a stream for a backyard farmer or gardener rather. But if you're a farm, um, there are all kinds of regulations. And I would, you know, I would try for 50 feet or more, um, but you can also build up um, soil or mulch piles beneath the compost. If you are on a hill um, and you have what you think might be a leachate problem for your compost, then try and control the moisture going in the bin so that you don't get too much coming out. You could also consider positioning your leaf pile or something like that directly below the bin to catch some of that. Okay, we got some more questions coming in here. We have a tumbler composter. Thought that was the way to go, how to get it started. Yeah, so the thing about a tumbler, a couple things. The only way for microbes to get in there is through the ingredients you're putting in there. Um, food scraps of all kinds are covered in microbes. So as every living being on the planet, including you or I, no matter how much that freaks us out, we're covered in microbes. They're crawling all over us all the time. I love it. Um, so without having direct contact to the soil, compost is gonna slow a little bit but I have seen really active compost bins happen in a completely cement lined system, such as the one we have at Thetford Elementary, which is not cement lined, but it's up off the ground. There's no contact with the soil. Um, getting air in there is easy when you turn it, but when you're turning it, if you're hearing thunk, 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 every time you turn it, you're actually squishing the air out of that mass in the middle. So it's not, it's just not really a great system. Um, to get it started, because I have seen it work, my niece has one I've been trying to help her with and she's getting some good results. 
Um, it takes care. It means shredding paper, lots of paper to go inside of there. Hay really doesn't work inside of one of those bins unless you cut it up. <laughs> you can, you know, so you need small particle sizes generally inside of one of those bins. Um, sawdust can work, but it, you can end up with these, you know, clogged up pockets with just not enough air. Um, mixing contents in a bin can be challenging too, because as you turn it, things of likeness and shape and weight go in different places. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a lot of good recommendations for those bins. What I generally recommend um, for schools that like to use them um, is it's a great learning opportunity, but it's twice the work. Um, so in a turning bin, you can really see the process of decomposition happening because you open that bin every day and you get to see the contents. Um, but you're going to have to move it into a pile anyway to let it finish. So why bother? If, but if you live in bear country, it may be the best thing for you to do to manage those food scraps until be, they become non-recognizable and then put it in a pile or bin system after that. I hope that's helpful. So we have, what are not acceptable food scraps? Okay, um, meat and bones in the backyard. That's pretty much it. Um, I would stay away from all meat. So fish, chicken, pork, beef, um, eggshells are fine, eggs are fine, um, bits of dairy are fine, but if you got a big hunk of moldy cheese, you're gonna attract animals as that slowly decomposes a big mass of protein. If you can bust up those big masses of protein into smaller pieces and mix them into the hot center of your pile, you can make those go quickly. At school, we manage all meat and bones. There's nothing that can't go in there. Um, and it all comes out beautifully. We're left with some chicken bones in the end, which, you know, it's an elementary school, so we call them dinosaur bones when we find them in the garden. Um, and those are slow release nutrients for the garden as well, those bones. Um, so in the backyard, the only thing you should not add is meat and bones. If you are getting high temperatures and you want to try it, um, just make sure that you're really monitoring that pile um, and maybe using some electric fencing to keep the bears away, which have been extremely active lately in my neighborhood. Okay, we have, um, sorry. Let, let's see, wait, I just want to go over a couple of other things I hear often. Tea bags, totally fine. However, some of the new fangled teas out there actually have plastic tea bags. Um, and they don't look plastic until they come out of your compost bin in the same form that they went in. So anything plastic, don't put it in, or just know it's gonna look exactly the same when it comes out, maybe cleaner. Um, uh, fruit stickers, take those off your fruits, please. Those are gonna end up staying in your compost bin. And I, this is kind of gross, but I like to share the story. I have seen one of those fruit stickers go through the digestive tract of a chicken, come out the other side, and you could still scan the UPC. So keep the plastic out. Um, Eggshells, if you can manage to crush them up, do that. Um, one thing I'll advise is, you know, when we make the omelets on the mornings or whatever, and we take all the eggs and we make that big egg tax the, the tower of, of eggs, eggshells, um, that's going to look the same way when you turn your compost pile out because you've created no way for organisms to get in there. Um, so if you can manage to crush them up at all, great. And if not, when you turn your compost out and you find that egg tower, crush it and throw it back in for next time. <laughs> okay, what about dog waste? Um, same as cat waste, so just be really careful. Um, don't mix it with your food waste because of transferable pathogens. Um, I just do it separately. What did you say you put your plastic bin on top of to keep out critters? Oh. Okay, um, that is called hardware cloth. Um, and toward the beginning of my slideshow, there's a picture of it. Um, and it's just this screen, a hard screen. Um, I like to use the half inch or the quarter inch. And that's referring to the size of the holes in that screen. Have you experimented with Bokashi composting, particularly for meat and dairy? You know, I have not personally done that um, 
because I don't, I don't eat meat, although I'm taking care of my dad now and he does. So maybe I should start. Um, I have not, I've heard really great things about it and I'd love to hear your experiences. If, if anyone is doing that, um, I'd love to hear a report on how that's going for you. Um, I, I do wanna just take this opportunity too to mention the green cones, um, which I also don't have any personal experience with, but I've met many teachers and homeowners at this point, both in suburbia out and out in the country that are using green cones for managing meat scraps. The difference is that um, it's an anaerobic compost system. You bury it, uh, so you never get an end product. You don't, you don't get the end product and put it in your garden. You basically bury this cone in the ground and worms and other critters are coming up and doing a slow anaerobic digestion process that eventually empties the cone out. Um, I haven't heard any problems with smells escaping or bears or anybody else having those. Um, having issues with the green cones. So I'm also very interested to hear reports about how those work. And if you're curious, just Google green, go, green cone composter. So we have, what about seeds from melons, big seeds, lobster shells? Yeah. Okay, so um, I have managed to get lobster shells to completely disappear in my compost. Um, we, we used to go to the beach every summer and my family would eat a huge amount of fish waste or fish and I'd, I'd bring all the fish waste back to my compost and I never saw anything come out the other side except clamshells, um, which I just bust up and throw in the garden as slow release um, minerals. Um, so yes, you can do that in small quantities and the same rule is for meat. So if, you're, if it's a lot, um, know that those are all very high protein items. They're gonna take longer to break down. They're gonna release smells as you do. Um, so those items might be something you wanna consider bringing to your transfer station to manage in the municipal recycling rather than in your backyard. Um, and they're, oh, seeds. Um, seeds will totally decompose in your compost bin. Um, weed seeds in particular and very small seeds really need a 131 degree temperature everywhere in the pile or wherever those weed seeds are to render them um, done. You know, they're not gonna, I, I can't, sterile, <laughs> sterile. Um, so weed seeds will survive through your compost if you do not get it high enough. Melon seeds and all those big seeds generally will decompose completely unless they roll out to the side and then that's when you get those like amazing, crazy pumpkin, melon, weird um, things growing on your compost pile because <laughs> they rolled out to the side. Um, and those are fine to eat too. Sometimes you get really interesting crosses that way. So I have cooking oil, sesame, olive, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so cooking oil, uh, if you're gonna pour a lot of oil, like you run a restaurant or something like that, that's a problem that's gonna cause you problems in your compost pile. If you've just got like a little can of um, grease, even if it's bacon grease, it's just a little bit, you can put that in the center of your pile. Um, also leftovers, we didn't talk about that, but leftover foods, throw them in there, totally fine. Everything's fine unless it's a giant pot of beef stew or something like that. Um, moldy stuff, all of that stuff. There's nothing too bad or too gross for a compost pile. Um, and Oils, if you have a lot of them, then I would consider bringing those to your transfer station as well. Or uh, depending on the kind of oil it is, you, you might ask uh, anyone with livestock if they have any interest in using that. Are there any paper products that shouldn't go into a pile? Good question, yes. Um, I don't put any glossy paper into my compost pile and I try to avoid the colored stuff too. Um, at this point, all newsprint, um, it's, it's soy-based ink. I don't, I've never worried about the inks. I've never seen any research showing um, massive accumulations of heavy metals or anything like that. So I don't worry about that at all. Um, I do pull tape off cardboard before I put it in my compost or use it in my garden. Otherwise it's there for you to find later. Um, I do remove staples because I don't want to hurt myself later, but like on a tea bag, I don't remove the staple because I'm lazy. Um, but I, knew, I do know people that do that. Um, not me. Um, and what's that? All of, I see avocado pits down here too. Yep. 
Throw them in there. If they roll off to the side, you might get a nice avocado house plant out of the deal. And then somebody said, can I use lawn clippings chopped up as much in the garden beds? Uh, yes, you can, but dry them out first. And you can dry them out pretty quickly on a day like today in your garden. <laughs> and then someone said, so couldn't you just bury your meat in bones then instead of putting them into trash? Yes, you could. Um, but you might find wildlife playing treasure hunt in your, your lawn. So there is a longer message up top here that uh, my wife and I built a house off the grid in 1974 and installed a composting toilet, which also had a garbage chute from the kitchen. We composted everything, including chicken bones and meat scraps. The only recognizable things in the finished compost were corn cobs and peanut shells. Now we live in town and have a flush toilet. The question, can we and other people count on hardware cloth to exclude rats? They have tough teeth. Yes. Um, I've seen it work many times. Uh, another really good way to exclude rats um, is to lift your bin up off the ground. Um, it, it discourages going under uh, and then put hardware cloth on the bottom of your bin. So um, I don't do that. I never ever do that and I've never had a problem. Um, but I do see rats around my compost pile in the winter and I don't worry about it. I mean, they're, they're kind of turning it for me and I get high heat. So any pathogens they're bringing in. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not concerned about rats being there. I would be concerned about rats digging in and, um, and making a mess. And I have seen, oh man, I have seen some awful compost with really big rats that I worry about. The rats at my house are like this big. Um, they're, they're just not a big deal. Um, but those big rats, uh, we have had them at many schools. And the thing that has saved us is hardware cloth um, that we look at every year to make sure that we're repairing any holes that those sharp teeth might have come through. That looks um, And the other thing I wanted to say to you is way to go for human manure composting. I'm a big fan and I've been doing it for a long, long time. And I'm sorry that you had to stop. So there's no more questions in the chat. Um, okay, and we're at 731. How good is that? Um, <laughs> awesome, thank you, Kat. Awesome, it's very rare for me to be on time like that. Um, thank you all so much, you had really great questions. Um, do I have information on vermiculture? I just saw come through the chat. Um, you can find some on my website and uh, you'd be welcome to send me an email. I'll do my best to get back to you. I have two worm bins. I've had them for many years, uh, thousands of worms. I love them. They come on field trips to school with me. Um, yep, ask me questions about worms and uh, by email, that'd be fine. Um, so this uh, presentation will be up on my YouTube channel uh, within a week or so. And um, I'll make sure that our friends from Springfield Library get it as well. And you all will get sent a link um, feel free to share it. Happy composting. Excellent. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, everybody. Bye.